All five of them. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, so, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Michael. I'm the events director here at Books for Magic. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to point out just some um, logistics for how tonight's going to go. Um, first off, I think everybody in this room is already doing this, but we'd love to keep everybody with their masks on and covering both your nose and mouth throughout the entire duration of this event. Um, for the audience Q&A tonight, we're going to be doing traditional hand-raised Q&A. Um, so start thinking of your questions now because you're not going to have time to type them out in Zoom. Um, after the talk tonight, Sarah is going to be doing signing and personalizing over at the desk where you checked in back there. Um, and we also have additional books available for purchase if you so choose. Uh, if you're joining us virtually via the YouTube live stream, hello. Uh, we highly encourage you to purchase a copy of Scoundrel online, and there's a link in the live stream description that'll get you where you need to go. Um, okay, so tonight is my absolute privilege to introduce tonight's event and welcome Sarah Wyman back to Books Are Magic to discuss her new book, Scoundrel, how a convicted murderer persuaded the women who loved him, the conservative establishment, and the courts to set him free. Scoundrel tells the tale of Edgar Smith, a murderer who conned his way to freedom, fame, and even a book deal, along the way deceiving the mid-century American conservative establishment. Um, Scoundrel not only narrates Smith's story, but also examines the systems that enabled him to manipulate his way to notoriety um, just to collapse in another violent crime shortly thereafter. Um, in the spirit of the best true crime writing, Scoundrel is as fascinating as it is disturbing, which is to say, very. Um, it's already lauded as being a masterfully crafted and mesmerizing new book, and it stands proud among Sarah's considerable past work. Um, speaking of, Sarah is also the author of The Real Lolita, which was named a best book of 2018 by many outlets and won the Arthur Ellis Award for Excellence in Crime Writing. She also edited Unspeakable Acts, winner of the Anthony Award for Best Nonfiction, Critical Work, um, women Crime Writers, and Troubled Daughters, Twisted Wives. Wyman writes the twice-monthly crime column for the New York Times Book Review, a 2020 National Magazine Award finalist for reporting and the Calderwood Journalism Fellow at McDowell. Her work has appeared most recently in New York, The Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, The Washington Post, and Airmail, while her fiction has been published in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, and numerous anthologies. Um, Sarah also writes the Crime Lady newsletter covering crime fiction, true crime, and all points in between. She lives in New York City. Uh, joining Sarah in conversation this evening is Alexis Co. Alexis is the author of You Never Forget Your First and Alice and Frida Forever, A Murder in Memphis. Um, she's a, a contributed to the New Yorker, the New York Times opinion section um, and magazine, uh, The New Republic, The Paris Review, and many others. She regularly appears on MSNBC, CNN, and the History Channel, where she was a consulting producer on Doris Kern Goodwin's Washington series. All right, so without further delay, everyone please give a very warm welcome to Sarah and Alexis. Amazing. <laughs> um, let me just take this all in just to see so many wonderful, dear faces who came all this way and paid money to see us talk about my book. Like, I'm never going to get over that. Thank you. <laughs> That's just great. And thank you, Alexis. And I'm so looking forward to talking about Scoundrel. Thank you for, for asking me to do this and for this book, which was really fun to read. Um, and because it did come out today, congratulations. Thank you. We probably haven't all read it, so could you give us a summary, an elevator pitch? So the really short elevator pitch is that this is a story of a wrongful conviction in reverse. The slightly less short version is that it's about the time when William F. Buckley, who was the founder of National Review and an architect of the conservative, modern conservative movement, which is as we once knew it, but perhaps is not as we know it now, um, how he helped advocate and free a man from Jersey's death row, and that turned out to be a terrible idea. <laughs> and I think what Scoundrel ended up also being about is what happens when we put our faith in people who don't deserve it, and who gets the benefit 
of that belief and how it's easy to be manipulated and be persuaded of things. And that also turns out to be a terrible idea. You know a lot about true crime, I think we can say with confidence. You come across extraordinary cases all the time, cases that you say, this should be a book. When did you decide that this should be a book and you should write it? Well, before I decided that this should be a book, at first I thought it was just going to be a magazine piece, which I was going to write for Hazlitt, a Canadian-based outlet, where I wrote the magazine version of The Real Lolita before it became a book. So that was supposed to be the follow-up magazine piece, which I started researching and reporting in earnest in, at the end of 2014. And I first heard about Edgar Smith and the murder of 15-year-old Victoria Zielinski in Bergen County, New Jersey in 1957, just sort of by happenstance. I was much more familiar with a comparable case or a comparable story involving Norman Mailer and his advocacy for Jack Henry Abbott, who was a convicted murderer who wrote in prison and whose writing was published in the New York Review of Books and eventually it would be published by Random House. And when that book, In the Belly of the Beast, came out, on the very day that Abbott got a rave review from the New York Times, he killed a man in a, at a bar and then went back to prison and would spend the rest of his life there and die there. And so that case somehow lodged in the cultural consciousness a lot more. I certainly had heard about it growing up. But when I saw this reference to William F. Buckley and Edgar Smith, once again, I wondered, why didn't I know anything about this and what was this all about? So I began to research it, and it became very clear that this was not a magazine piece. There was just far too much information and material that I needed to wait because I was working on a whole bunch of other things, including trying to turn The Real Lolita into a book. But also, Edgar himself was, was alive at the time, and in talking to certain sources, I realized that they just wouldn't talk to me as long as he was still around, so I kind of had to wait him out which is a strange thing to say, <laughs> but it's kind of true. And then I would periodically check the Bureau of Prisons website and look up his inmate number, just be like, is this a wellness check? Or just whatever <laughs> they Because I just, unfortunately, it is easier because you don't, you don't have to libel the dead, you, or you can't libel the dead. And when people are living, it's a lot trickier. And, having hired a fact checker for this book, which was a much, a very necessary thing to do, and I'm so grateful for her. Her name's Rosemary Ho, and she is now a student at the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and is amazing, and really put me through my paces, and I wish that we could all get our books fact checked, but publishers don't pay for that, so that's also a problem. So I'm, I'm going off, but you see what I mean. Yes, yeah. yes, and I, I like my subjects dead. I don't. I don't <laughs> imagine this. Mm -hmm. um, no living presidents for you. No, very much no. William F. Buckley, this was the part that caught my eye in, in that first email. A, a millionaire, the voice of American conservatism. Like, we're used to seeing him fight with Gar Vidal. This is not his usual thing. And no, not at all. He, his involvement is surprising. When we see an advocate for someone like that, you know, they do tend to be a woman who's in love with the man, um, has some sort of background, something in common. Um, he didn't need this this case. So, so how did this happen? How did he come to believe him, and what was his sort of journey? Well, to backtrack just a little bit, um, because Buckley came on the scene maybe five years after Edgar was convicted, and in 1962, at that point. Edgar had survived several stays of execution, and he, at that point, he was not quite yet the longest serving death row prisoner in America, but he would become that, which, again, for, from hindsight, when people are on death row for decades upon decades, that just seems just bizarre and strange, but that's how it was in the 60s. And so he mentioned in a very friendly newspaper interview with a reporter who had once been his high school gym teacher. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of random details like this in the book. It's, it, it just never failed to amaze me. <laughs> but he he's gives this friendly interview where he talks about some, a, an official at the prison who had a copy of National Review, and then that official got moved to a different prison, so he no longer had access to the magazine anymore. And so this detail caught the attention of Buckley through a different reporter 
who got interested in the case and started writing Smith, and then eventually Buckley started to write Smith, and that the initial piece by Donald Cox was published in October of 63, in which it poked at inconsistencies in Smith's so-called confession and some of the ways in which the police handled things, and certainly gave the, some idea, it gave, went into some detail about how maybe there were uh, there was a possibility that Smith did not kill Vicki Zielinski. And then the correspondence between Smith and Buckley just kept going, and mostly it was about legal stuff, but eventually it would turn, and at least in Buckley's mind, he thought that he was developing a genuine friendship with Edgar Smith. And that's what I kept coming back to, is that it wasn't calculated or cynical on Buckley's part. That's just, he was kind of naive, he was kind of gullible. This would come up in other instances in his life that he would trust the wrong people with money or trust the wrong people to handle certain parts, of certain things that he was supposed to take care of and it got him into real trouble and this would just come up again and again. So I think someone like Edgar Smith who was very adept at figuring out people's weaknesses, he saw what Buckley's weaknesses were and exploited them. I wanna see Sophie Wilkins for another question, his editor. But let's talk about the women who knew him better than Buckley. Buckley meets him at a particular time in his life, but he has a mother, he had wives, girlfriends, daughter, granddaughter. Um, you know, the question is, does Smith hate women and did they know that? I mean, that's a good question. I think that ultimately, the book that I ended up writing about was about misogyny and about a man who did hate women and never failed to invoke that again and again. This was someone who he beat wives, he sexually assaulted wives and girlfriends, he didn't have any boundaries, but at the, he also would, he had, he had a type, his first wife and his second wife he met roughly when they were around the same age, they were kind of the same height and weight and build, and they were very trusting, they were pretty naive, but it was easy to be that way in that environment, especially if you grew up rather sheltered or just didn't have access to, if you weren't necessarily street smart, for lack of a better term. And it doesn't mean that they were like, bad or anything, they weren't, they just, they thought that he was something that he wasn't. And Edgar in 1957, when he's 23 years old and has come out of military service it, with a questionable discharge and he can't hold a job and he has a wife at home and he has a three month old baby but he's kind of acting like he's still single and even his friends are thinking this is a little bit weird. And so that's the sort of backdrop for how he ends up encountering Vicky as she's walking home from a friend's house and he knew her slightly because she was also going out on dates with a friend of his and this same friend he would later say in court that he did it and that he had been with Vicky, that she had been in the car, that they had gotten into a fight, that he hit her and then she ran out but oh well I saw her and this other guy came up and then I left and it's ridiculous on its face of it and throughout this two-week trial that happened in 57 the prosecutors attacks this again and again because Edgar makes the monumental decision to testify in his own defense, which I think modern readers would say, that's a very dumb idea, <laughs> but people did this all the time. And it was a circus and it was well covered, not just in New Jersey, but also in New York and all over national and the like. And then after Edgar is on death row, he writes a nonfiction book ex saying that he's innocent and here's why, and it is, a rather persuasive volume, having read it multiple times, and I felt myself getting sucked into Edgar's worldview and being like, no, no, stop doing that. <laughs> this is how it also felt reading the letters that he would send to Buckley and also to Sophie Wilkins, his book editor, who became a lot more. So that was a perfect entree to that. Um, I, of course, get really excited about the archives and discoveries that you make in them, and you made quite a discovery when it comes to his editor. How did you first recognize that? How did you sort of reconstruct it? So this goes back to your initial question of how I knew that this project was a book. Because initially when I worked on it in 
for late 2014 and early 2015. And this is also when I was in very brief and very curt exchange with Edgar himself and realizing that this was a fruitless exercise that I needed to stop because he wasn't going to tell me anything of use. And uh, as I mentioned, I kind of needed to wait him out. But also because at that point, I was not given access to William F. Buckley's archives. That would come much later. And it wasn't until I was doing a random Google search one day in early 2016, and I found a reference to an archive at Columbia University held by Sophie Wilkins, whom I knew was Edgar's book editor at Brief Against Death. So I do my thing and request boxes, and it's open to the public, and I go there one day in February of 2016, just thinking I was just going to look at correspondence between an editor and her author, not really thinking much of it. And then I start reading. <laughs> and then I realize that most of this should be rated NC-17. <laughs> and I'm sitting at Butler Library in the Rare Books and Manuscript Division <laughs> being like, what, what am I reading here? And, and uh, how do I not scream? And how do I not just, I don't even know how to react properly. <laughs> because I don't even know who else has gone through this, maybe an archivist, and they're not saying anything, and I'm not about to go ask them, hey, did you read this really salacious letter? <laughs> I don't even know what to make of it. So that's kind of when I knew it was a book. But also, more practically speaking, Sophie was such a voluminous keeper of letters, and she wrote, she was hypergraphic, basically. Like she, she was the kind of person who would write three letters when someone was writing one every three weeks. She just was like that, driven to just keep corresponding and, and to like pouring out her emotions. And she was somebody who at Knopf, every, the atmosphere was very quiet and buttoned down and reserved and she was very gregarious and open and emotional and wore her heart on her sleeve and people just didn't know what to make of her. But because she was also having trouble acquiring books and having much in the way of a foothold, when she learned of Edgar Smith through an article in Esquire in 1965 that Buckley wrote, and at the very end it said that you could donate to his defense fund, she did so and then wrote Buckley based on the letters of Edgar Smith that you're quoting, I think that he might have the potential to write a book, and if so, I'd like to know more about it. And then a, lot, a, a fair amount of time passes, it's summer of 67, Finally, she's put in touch with Edgar through his mother. There's a little bit of, of complication before she's approved as a correspondence. And then they really start to get going in July of 67. And it starts out professional. And then it turns. And then it turns some more. <laughs> and then it turns some more so that by the end, they're declaring love to one another and just getting really hot and heavy. Not like the emails that my editor has. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are instances of editors and authors having relationships. I think there was a podcast, um, Once Upon a Time in Bennington College, that Lily Analik hosted, mm -hmm. where there is some talk about Donna Tartt's relationship with Gary Fiskajon. But again, it's very like, it isn't, it's not, it's not like this. <laughs> Donna Tartt wasn't in prison. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, you say, I want to go back to yeah. something that you said earlier. Um, you talked about getting sucked in. And it's a really tricky thing when you're writing about a person who's known as charismatic. Because that's the hardest thing in the world to experience when you're not experiencing it and describe it. Um, but at the same time, so you have to give yourself over a little bit, but then you have to pull back. And obviously he was quite good at this. So what were the particular points that he, you know, what did you find that was really interesting about his charm? I mean, I didn't find his charm that interesting at all. <laughs> um, and if anything, I just, it's not that I'm against charisma. I just didn't be really <laughs> suspicious of it. Sure. So I would be reading through these letters and just trying to be like, look, I know the whole story and I know how it ends and I know what happens and I know that there is a 15-year-old girl who did not have a chance to live because of this man. And, he, and that fact just kept getting forgotten over and over again. And Sophie, especially in letters to Buckley after everything went down, she would express a lot of remorse and regret about it, but she, try, I think, tried to understand her own culpability in this. So because I knew all of that, when I would read in chronological order these letters and try to understand what was going on from a psychological standpoint, 
I just tried to think through, well, I can step out of it and I'm just going to try my very best to be in Sophie's head or I'm going to try my best to be in Buckley's head and I can never get there because I'm not them and they're not me, but it is kind of a psychological leap that I needed to make in order to inhabit and that thus make them interesting and credible on the page. So it was really just trying to do that, but I, I didn't lose myself in it. Like there would be times when I'd read these letters and feel myself be getting sucked in and then I'd have to pull back and go, no, I'm, this is actually very anger inducing and I need to carry that through, but I also don't want to, you know, tell the reader that I'm angry. I want them to infer everything because I need to pull back as a narrator and just let the story unfold. And that was part, you know, that was a specific structural choice that I made. Be and in part because there was just so much story. There were so many rich characters, so many people whose stories really needed to be telling. My own story didn't matter here. We're, I feel like that's a surprise. That's like a career surprise. You may not get any more. Like the archive owes you nothing sort of no, thing. No, they never do. <laughs> yes. But were there any other surprises along the way? Well, I mean, the fact that I finally did get permission to go to Yale and look at William F. Buckley's archive. So initially I was turned down, I think because, who knows, I didn't have the credentials or whatever. And then I, it was the summer of 2019, I was well into the research and the writing. I had written a lot of the Sophie sections, I'd written the initial part. And I thought, okay, it's time. So I sent an email to Buckley's son, Christopher, who is the executor of the estate, and I just basically laid it out that it was under contract, have a deadline, and oh, by the way, I've looked at this archive and I have material that's not in Buckley's archives. Here's a letter. So I attached that. And then six hours later, he said, permission granted. So mm -hmm. then I went off to Yale and uh, took my iPad and took many, 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 many PDFs. And within five minutes of looking through the relevant boxes, I was able to figure out some details that I had never known. Like, I never knew at that point what the his first, Edgar's first wife, Patricia, after she left, she married someone, and I just did not know her, her married name. And there it was in a, in a document. So, be, so between that and having my laptop and being able to plug into Ancestry.com, which, as I like to say, that and Newspapers.com are also how I write my books, yeah. because having all those relevant details right at my digital fingertips is just amazing. So I was able to figure out who she, where she was, what her ultimate name was, where her daughter was, called the, emailed the daughter within a day, daughter responds, and we're setting up an interview, and I'm doing this all from the archive. So that would never have happened if I hadn't had permission to get into Buckley's archives. And then there was other court documents that I would not have been able to get access to. There's a divorce complaint between Vicky's parents that was particularly incendiary that Buckley was able to get a copy of and that there was no way I was ever gonna get it elsewhere. So things like that. There were just a lot, I mean, unlike the real Lolita where I was really just mining information and using every scrap possible, here I had much more than I knew what to do with. And it was really the question of what information is useful for the narrative. And so the, so Buckley's archives were closed, and but you could write some sort of letter to the estate and they can grant you access or not, and they Correct. usually say no. So it's nice that they said yes. Well, apparently they usually say yes. They do? Yeah. <laughs> but then why is it closed? <laughs> I think just like Christopher wants control, and yeah. some errors are like that. And certainly this is a thing where certain living authors or authors who have designated trustees, they just really want to brandish control over anybody who works in it. So this also happened when I was working on The Real Lolita and had to get into the Nabokov archives the ones, uh, not the Library of Congress, which are open, but the one at the New York Public Library, the Burke Collection. And there I had to ask for Andrew Wiley's permission. It was a whole thing, and I had to create a letter with all of my editors signing it, and my agent signing it, and it was just like this whole production. And then he just said yes within an hour, which was pretty funny. But I, the, the story that I heard as to what happened is that some researcher had like, taken material from the archive without permission and then published an article based on it. It was like, kind of not kosher. So after that, they were just like, we've got to vet everybody who comes in. Yeah. 
Um, the book came out today, which means that you're just starting to see the world react and see what they have to say about it, which is really interesting as someone who's been alone with it for a long time, with a few other people, but right. it's, it's now out in the world. Have you been surprised at some of the focus? Is there something else that we should um, look at? What is, what is the conversation that you hope to see around the book? I mean, so far I feel like the conversation that I'm seeing around Scoundrel is more or less what I want to see. Like the review today in the New York Times really went into me calling out misogyny, which, yes, yes I did, because <laughs> it was really important that I do that. And I mean, look, every critical reaction is going to bring, is going to have a specific bent and is, is always reflective of the reviewer. And I know this because I've been a critic a really long time and especially over the last year or so that I've been writing the crime column at the New York Times, I bring my own sensibility to reviewing crime fiction, and that's all I can ever do. I'm a reader, I read, I write my impression of a book, and I hope that people get it or they don't, and that's I can't control that. But once a book is out in the world, that it's beyond any author's control, so certainly, now that Scoundrel is available for public consumption, people can interpret it however they want. And that just means, I hope, that it's a book that is ripe for a lot of interpretation. What is the legacy of the case? <sighs> I've been thinking about this because you had mentioned that this was a question that you wanted to ask. And I think it's just furthering this ongoing project I've had that women and girls matter. And so often their perspectives, their voices, their lives are stomped on, they're erased, they're neglected, they're overlooked, they're cast aside in favor of larger narratives. And I think what I keep coming back to is the way that Edgar Smith described Vicky, not in Grief Against Death, but in the novel that he wrote a couple of years later called A Reasonable Doubt, where he fictionalized her as Suzanne Jeffers and just described her in this way that was just totally out of bounds and frank, like it was a much creepier and more awful reading experience because it was utter sexualization. And I think there is some degree of complicitness, the complicity that Buckley and Sophie Wilkins and anybody who is professionally responsible for lifting up Edgar Smith as a literary celebrity. And I just hope that people can grapple not just with the specificity of this case, but in looking at any instance where we're trying to separate the art from the artist, because can we really? Are we being on time? I think we're, I'll ask one more question and then I'll turn it okay. over. Um, no, I'll turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like someone's gonna ask this. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. Hi, congratulations. Um, Thank you. What did, what did Wilkins and Buckley like about his writing? I think just what did they think made it special? What did they like about his writing, particularly his editor, Sophie Wilkins? I think they liked that he wrote in this sort of straightforward manner that presented, especially in Brief Against Death, that just presented what was going on. It was very vivid. It was very... There was a visceral quality, but also that there was, I guess, a sense of perceived self-awareness about his situation, even though it turned out to be lies. <laughs> and so that was also reflective in the letters. And that's also what I meant by getting sucked in, because there was sort of this literary bent to how he was writing, that he was very deliberate with word choice and prose style and syntax which most writing from prison may not have come up to that level. And it wasn't as if there weren't other writers or people writing treatises in, in prison, and certainly there still are today and there should be. But all, I just feel like they saw something that was there, and maybe it was, but it was almost like a flicker. And certainly if it was there in Brief Against Death, I think Sophie's editorial work had a lot to do with it, because certainly later on in later works, it just the spark, whatever spark was gone, and it was even reflective in the later letters that Edgar wrote that I was able to read. Did 
Do you see the various um, like additions, like the first draft, the second draft? With so you so you know she had to have. Oh yeah. End. <laughs> when it was still called Murder and Mawa, and it was still too long, and it just was kind of unreadable. Mm. And then it just became this very well crafted document. Mm. Like there was a big difference. Editors. They or necessary. Yeah, they're great. We should keep them. I suppose, yeah, I suppose one legacy is this book is a pay into the power of editing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, first, congratulations, Sarah. Um, you've been talking a lot about how there was so much information and so much you had to sort through. Was there anything particularly juicy or a particular um, note that you ended up having to leave out of the book? So you had to go through so much in the archives and secondary sources. Was there anything particularly juicy that you had to leave out? There were a couple of other women that Edgar corresponded with and may have had other epistolary type relationships with. One of the reasons I left them out is I was never able to figure out their full names. There was one named Bonnie who came in pretty early on. I know Sophie referenced her in the summer and the fall of 67 as someone that she knew, but I was never able to figure out who Bonnie was. And so because of that, it just, it didn't feel right to just have someone with her first name in the narrative when what was happening there, I could better convey through the stories of women who got involved with Edgar a little later and who I, I knew much more of. And that, I mean, Juliet Scheinman, who read Brief Against Death was spurred to write Edgar, also became friendly with Sophie and then developed her own relationship. And then when Edgar got out, he and Juliet were involved in real life until that sort of imploded a few months later. So I found because her story was so rich and I was able to track down one of her sons who gave me a lot more information, I felt like I could highlight her story a little bit more than some of the others. So that's I guess one big thing. It's so hard, that happens so often in the archives where you find a letter, you find something about a woman, you only have her first name, you try really hard to track her down, it's impossible, so then what do you do? Do you exclude her from the story because you can't really substantiate it? It's, it's a terrible position. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one thing I've learned from publishing The Real Lolita is that as much as we want to think that books are fixed documents, they never end up being that way. And I know this because maybe a month before The Real Lolita published, I got the FBI file of the perpetrator, the man who was responsible for kidnapping Sally Horner. And that gave me details that I was not able to get in time. So I wrote a whole afterword <laughs> to The Real Lolita, and it's in the paperback. So I fully expect that now that Scoundrel is available, I'll be hearing from people who will fill in information. I'm supposed to be talking with someone who knew Edgar well, li late in his er first prison stint and who has some criminal justice involvement and mm -hmm. I'm hoping he'll be able to tell me a little bit more, but to have more contemporaneous accounts is always beneficial even if a book is, quote, done. Yeah, you always want to hear that. It's so interesting. It's like really exciting. Um, Um, you corresponded with Smith, but that, I mean that's not in the book until the very end. I've read it. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Not a lie. Um, so can you talk about your decision to put that in the very end? It, it also it feels a lot like a footnote almost, like as you're reading the book. Um, and, and yeah, and so I just thought it was a really interesting decision. You corresponded with Edgar Smith, but you didn't mention it until the end of the book. So how did you make that decision? Well, part of it is that I was telling the story chronologically. So I felt like if I gave that away initially, even though in the introduction I spell out exactly what happened, and it's not a story of who done it. It really is a story of how the hell did this happen? <sighs> and I just felt like because in the talent, in the way that I structured the book, I really wanted to make it clear to myself that he was the least interesting character in the book. Yes, it's called Scoundrel, but structurally it's really about the people in his orbit and how they were manipulated into going along with his version of events. And so because when I corresponded with him, I already knew a lot of the facts and I was able to track down a lot of documents. 
So I had a sense of the various versions that he was telling of how he ended up killing Vicky Zielinski. But there were just so many of them, and it was hard to believe or even put any credence in any of them. But the one that I put the most faith in, so to speak, is when he told a parole board, when they asked him, why did you do it? I was angry. It's like, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. We don't really need that much more. It's not, there's so many fictional accounts of killers where we get deep into their mindset and their criminal masterminds. It's like, nah, he was just, he was just some dude. <laughs> and he was able to exceed his capabilities a lot more than a lot of dudes do. But ultimately, <laughs> this is just what he was doing. So when I corresponded with him, at first I was, because I just didn't know how he was going to respond, I just said that I was researching something about William F. Buckley, which was true, and I knew that he was friends with Buckley, which was true, and I wanted him to comment on that. And he wrote me this very loquacious thing. You're the first correspondent who ever wrote me from Brooklyn, where I lived at the time. And, um, when I was on the run at one point, I was somewhere near Ebbets Field. It was just ridiculous. I'm like, I don't know you. Why are you telling me these things? <laughs> and then I think he just wanted, but he also wanted to know more about me and why I was writing him. And I gave him some details about other people who he didn't know that they had died. And then I realized this is just not going anywhere. I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions that I'm curious. I'm sure he won't answer them. And I sent that letter, and about a month later, he writes, I think you're writing a book about me, and I don't want to have any part of this. And then proceeded to answer every single question. <laughs> I <asked him> because <laughs> it's compulsion. I keep coming across this. People just cannot help themselves. They reveal themselves time and time again. <laughs> any other questions? All right, well, I was going to ask, there, as a reader, there are always parts of the book that stay with you, that you think about good and bad. I, I have been thinking about the description of a 15-year-old and what she's wearing. Mm -hmm. what, what sort of stays with you, the good and the bad? What, what are these moments that you think about a lot now that you know the book is it's behind you in some ways? It's been into the publishing house for quite a while. You've had some distance, but I, I find I tend to think about the same thing. I mean, one that I think about, and this is just a function of how many interesting people intersected with this story, but I think about when I interviewed Mary Higgins Clark, the queen of suspense, who was a major influence on crime fiction and frankly on my own writing, like Where Are the Children really is the inflection point between the domestic suspense of the early to mid 40s and the early 70s to the psychological suspense that came after and that really you know, shifted again with Gone Girl. So Mary, I interviewed her for a piece I was writing on the real life case that inspired Where Are the Children? And in that book, she referenced the Edgar Smith case. And I asked her about this and then she told me, oh, I went to the trial. And I was like, why? Like, well, I was a housewife and there wasn't much for entertainment. <laughs> so she attended and Apparently, this case had a major influence on her own writing career, and she would ultimately write an essay published in the late 70s called Edgar Smith, The Human Copperhead, in which she detailed how she always kept up with every facet of the story and every twist and every turn, including when he k nearly killed another woman and went back to prison. And she basically said that this spurred her into switching from writing like romances and to writing crime. So I feel like there's like this lineage that this case has from a crime writer of stature like Mary Higgins Clark to what I'm trying to do. So I feel I feel that I felt that connection a lot when I think about that. And I think there was a question. Yes. Yeah, um, I was curious because you mentioned that you discussed the um, that that you lay out the case the, in the introduction. Was there a point at which you were considering not doing that? I noticed it was brought up in the Times for you also. Was there a point where you like said I'm just going to tell the story strictly in chronological fashion? And I kind of, you know, he did that. So it's whether it's whether you were going to write it in chronological order. I think because, well, part of it was when I wrote an early draft of the introduction. I think 
for the book proposal, it started out that way. And I just could never figure out any other way than just to be like, here's what happened. Because I think it was a way of reducing any power that Edgar Smith had over the story. I just didn't want him to take over the narrative. It was really important to just sort of take the wind out of the sails and be like, he's dead, here's what he did, here are the people that are harmed as a result, and here's why this happened. And then I could start with chapter one about Vicky and just being like, I'm gonna start with her because now that we know the contours of the story, let's introduce the person whose life was snuffed out so prematurely and who we should always keep in mind as we're reading through every twist and every permutation and combination and the like that happens thereafter. So that's, I guess, why I did it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And congratulations. Thank you. All right, everybody. Um, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, obviously, Sarah and Alexis. <clears throat> Sorry. Sarah, congratulations on this book. Um, so what's going to happen now is we're going to move Sarah over to the desk where you checked in for the signing. Um, I know that a lot of you have books already, but we also have copies of Scoundrel, as well as um, all of Sarah's and Alexis's books over at the uh, desk as well, and we hope that you all pick them up. Um, all right, I think that's about it. Um, so we'll see you at the signing, and let's have another really big round of applause for us. Yeah, it's incredible.